Shear built a rail locomotive for him, 17, but little is known about it, including whether or not it actually ran. The death of a company workman in an accident involving the engine is said to have caused the company to not proceed to running it on their existing railway. 18. To date, the only known information about it comes from a drawing preserved at the Science Museum, London, together with a letter written by Trevithick to his friend Davies Giddy. The design incorporated a single horizontal cylinder enclosed in a return flue boiler. A flywheel drove the wheels on one side through spur gears and the axles were mounted directly on the boiler, with no frame. 19. On the drawing, the piston rod, guide bars and crosshead are located directly above the firebox door, thus making the engine extremely dangerous to fire while moving. 20. Furthermore, the first drawing by Daniel Shute indicates that the locomotive ran on a platway with a track gauge of 3 feet. 914 millimeters. Dot this is the drawing used as the basis of all images and replicas of the later Penwide Aaron locomotive, as no plans for that locomotive have survived. Dot 21. London Steam Carriage. The London Steam Carriage, by Trevithick and Vivian, demonstrated in London in 1803 the puffing devil was unable to maintain sufficient steam pressure for long periods and would have been of little practical use. He built another steam-powered road vehicle in 1803, called the London Steam Carriage, which attracted much attention from the public and press when he drove it that year in London from Hoban to Paddington and back. It was uncomfortable for passengers and proved more expensive to run than a horse-drawn carriage, and was abandoned. In 1831, Trevithick gave evidence to a parliamentary select committee on steam carriages. 22. Tragedy at Greenwich. Also in 1803, one of Trevithick's stationary pumping engines in use at Greenwich exploded, killing foreman. Although Trevithick considered the explosion to be caused by a case of Water to a measured height to measure the work done. The engine ran at 40 piston strokes a minute, with an unprecedented boiler pressure of 145 psi, 1000 kpa. Colebrookdale locomotive. A drawing of the Colebrookdale locomotive from the Science Museum in 1802. The Colebrookdale company in Shropshire built a rail locomotive for him. 17 but little is known about it, including whether or not it actually ran. The death of a company workman in an accident involving the engine is said to have caused the company to not proceed to running it on their existing railway. 18. To date, the only known information about it comes from a drawing preserved at the Science Museum, London, together with a letter written by Trevithick to his friend Davies Giddy. The design incorporated a single horizontal cylinder enclosed in a return flue boiler. A flywheel drove the wheels on one side through spur gears and the axles were mounted directly on the boiler, with no frame. 19. On the drawing, the piston rod, guide bars and crosshead are located directly above the firebox door, thus making the engine extremely dangerous to fire while moving. 20. Furthermore. The first drawing by Daniel Shute indicates that the locomotive ran on a platway with a track gauge of 3 feet, 914 millimeters. This is the drawing used as the basis of all images and replicas of the later Penwide Aaron locomotive, as no plans for that locomotive have survived. 21. London Steam Carriage. The London Steam Carriage, by Trevithick and Vivian. Demonstrated in London in 1803 the puffing devil was unable to maintain sufficient steam pressure for long periods, and would have been of little practical use. He built another steam-powered road vehicle in 1803, called the London Steam Carriage, which attracted much attention from the public and press when he drove it that year in London from Hoban to Paddington and back. It was uncomfortable for passengers and proved more expensive to run than a horse-drawn carriage, and was abandoned. In 1831, 
Trevor Thick gave evidence to a parliamentary select committee on steam carriages. 22. Tragedy at Greenwich. Also in 1803, one of Trevor Thick's stationary pumping engines in use at Greenwich exploded, killing foreman. Although Trevor Thick considered the explosion to be caused by a case of careless operation rather than design error, the incident was exploited relentlessly by James Watt and Matthew Bolton, competitors and promoters of the low-pressure engine, who highlighted the perceived risks of using high-pressure steam. Trevor Thick's response was to incorporate two safety valves into future designs, only one of which could be adjusted by the operator. 23. The adjustable valve comprised a disc covering a small hole at the top of the boiler above the water level in the steam chest. The force exerted by the steam pressure was equalized by an opposite force created by a weight attached to a pivoted lever. The position of the weight on the lever was adjustable thus allowing the operator to set the maximum steam pressure. Trevor Thick also added a fusible plug of lead positioned in the boiler just below the minimum safe water level. Under normal operation the water temperature could not exceed that of boiling water and kept the lead below its melting point. If the water ran low, it exposed the lead plug, and the cooling effect of the water was lost. The temperature would then rise sufficiently to melt the lead, releasing steam into the fire reducing the boiler pressure and providing an audible alarm in sufficient time for the operator to damp the fire and let the boiler cool before damage could occur. He also introduced the hydraulic testing of boilers and the use of a mercury manometer to indicate the pressure. Pen wide Aaron locomotive. Trevithick's 1804 locomotive. This full-scale reconstruction is in the National Waterfront Museum Swansea. In 1802, Trevor Thick built one of his high-pressure steam engines tar driver hammer at the Penwide Iron Ironworks in Merthyr Tydfil Mid Glamorgan. With the assistance of Rhys Jones, an employee of Ironworks and under the supervision of Samuel Humphrey, the proprietor, he mounted the engine on wheels and turned it into a locomotive. In 1803, Trevor Thick sold the patents for his locomotive Esto Samuel Humphrey. Humphrey was so impressed with Trevor Thick's locomotive that he made a bet with another iron master, Richard Crawshay, for 500 guineas that Trevor Thick's steam locomotive could haul 10 tons of iron along the Merthyr tram road from Penny Darren, 51 degree 4503 N3 degree 2233 W, to Abersinan. 51 degree 3844 and 3 degree 1927W, a distance of 9.75 miles, 15.69 kilometers. Amid great interest from the public, on 21 February 1804 it successfully carried 10 tons of iron, 5 wagons and 70 men the full distance in 4 hours and 5 minutes, an average speed of approximately 2.4 miles per hour. 3.9 kilometers per hour. Dot 24, as well as Humphrey, Crawshay, and passengers. Other witnesses included Mr. Giddy, a respected patron of Trevithick and an engineer from the government. Dot 25. The engineer from the government was probably a safety inspector and particularly interested in the boiler's ability to withstand high steam pressures. The configuration of the Penwide Aaron engine differed from the Colebrookdale engine. The cylinder was moved to the other end of the boiler so that the fire door was out of the way of the moving parts. Thys obviously also involved putting the crankshaft at the chimney end. The locomotive comprised a boiler with a single return flue mounted on a four-wheel frame. At one end, a single cylinder with very long stroke was mounted partly in the boiler, and a piston rod crosshead ran out along a slide bar, an arrangement that looked like a giant trombone. As there was only one cylinder, this was coupled to a large flywheel mounted on one side. The rotational inertia of the flywheel would even out the movement that was transmitted to a central cogwheel that was, in turn connected to the driving wheels. It used a high-pressure cylinder without a condenser, 
the exhaust steam was sent up the chimney assisting the draft through the fire, increasing efficiency even more. The bet was won. Despite many people's doubts, it had been shown that, provided that the gradient was sufficiently gentle, it was possible to successfully haul heavy carriages along a smooth iron road using the adhesive weight alone of a suitably heavy and powerful steam locomotive. Trevithix was probably the first to do so winking sad smiley 26, however some of the short cast iron plates of the tram road broke under the locomotive as hay were intended only to support the lighter axle load of horse-drawn wagons and so the tram road returned to horsepower after the initial test run. Humphrey was pleased he won his bet. The engine was placed on blocks and reverted to its original stationary job of driving hammers. In modern-day Merthyr Tydfil, behind the monument to Trevithick's locomotive lies a stone wall, the sole remainder of the former boundary wall of Homfrey's Penny Darren House. 27. A full-scale working reconstruction of the Penny Darren locomotive was commissioned in 1981 and delivered to the Welsh Industrial and Maritime Museum in Cardiff. When that closed, it was moved to the National Waterfront Museum in Swansea. 28. Several times a year it is run on a 40 m, 130 feet, length of rail outside the museum. Newcastle Locomotive Christopher Blackett, proprietor of the Wylam Colliery near Newcastle, heard of the success in Wales and wrote to Trevithick asking for locomotive designs. These were sent to John Whitfield at Gateshead Trevithick's agent who in 1804 built what was probably the first locomotive to have flanged wheels. 29. Blackett was using wooden rails for his tramway and, once again, Trevithick's machine was to prove too heavy for its track. 30. 31. Catch me who can. Trevithick Steam Circus In 1808 Trevithick publicized his steam railway locomotive expertise by building a new locomotive called Catch Me Who Can Build for him by John Hazeldin and John Erpeth Rastrick at Bridge North in Shropshire, and named by Davies Giddy's daughter. The configuration differed from the previous locomotives in that cylinder was mounted vertically and drove a pair of wheels directly without a fly wheel or gearing. 32. This was probably Trevithick's fourth locomotive, after those used at Colebrookdale Penwide Iron Iron Works, and the Wylam Colliery. He ran it on a circular track just south of the present-day Euston Square Tube Station in London. The site in Bloomsbury has recently been identified archaeologically as that occupied by the Chadwick Building, part of University College London. 33. Admission to the steam circus was one shilling including a ride and it was intended to show that rail travel was faster than by horse. This venture also suffered from weak tracks and public interest was limited. Trevithick was disappointed by the response and designed no more railway locomotives. It was not until 1812 that twin-cylinder steam locomotives, built by Matthew Murray in Holbeck, successfully started replacing horses for hauling coal wagons on the edge railed rack and pinion middleton railway from middleton colliery to leeds west yorkshire engineering projects thames tunnel robert Vargy, another cornish engineer was selected by the thames archway company in 1805 to drive a tunnel under the river thames at rotherheath Vargy encountered serious problems with water influx and had got no further than sinking the end shafts when the directors called in Trevithick for consultation. Their directors agreed to pay Trevithick £1,000, the equivalent of £84,670 in 2021, 34, if he could successfully complete the tunnel, a length of 1,220 feet, 370 m. In August, 1807, he began driving a small pilot tunnel. Or driftway 5 feet, 1.5 m, high tapering from 2 feet 6 inches, 0.76 m, at the top to 3 feet, 0.91 m, at the bottom. 
by the 23rd of December, after it had progressed 950 feet, 290 m. Progress was delayed after a sudden rush of water, and only one month later on the 26th of January, 1808, at 1,040 feet, 320 m, a more serious in rush occurred. The tunnel was flooded, Trevithick, being the last to leave, was nearly drowned. Clay was dumped on the riverbed to seal the hole, and the tunnel was drained, but mining was now more difficult. Progress stalled, and a few of the directors attempted to discredit Trevithick, but the quality of his work was eventually upheld by two colliery engineers from the north of England. Despite suggesting various building techniques to complete the project, including a submerged cast iron tube, Trevithick's links with company ceased and the project was never actually completed. Completion The first successful tunnel under the Thames was started by Sir Marquis Zambard Brunel in 1823, 0.75 miles, 1200 m, upstream assisted by his son Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who also nearly died in a tunnel collapse. Mark Brunel finally completed it in 1843, the delays being due to problems with funding. Trevithick's suggestion of a submerged tube approach was successfully implemented for the first time across the Detroit River between Michigan in the United States and Ontario in Canada with the construction of the Michigan Central Railway Tunnel, under the engineering supervision of the New York Central Railway's engineering vice president, William J. Wilgus. Construction began in 1903 and was completed in 1910. The Detroit Windsor Tunnel which was completed in 1934 automotive traffic and the tunnel under the Hong Kong Harbour were also submerged tube designs. Return to London. Trevithick went on to research other projects to exploit his high-pressure steam engines, boring brass falcon and manufacture, stone crushing, rolling mills, forge hammers, blast furnace blowers as well as their traditional mining applications. He also built a barge powered by paddle wheels and several dredges. Trevithick saw opportunities in London and persuaded his wife and four children reluctantly to join him in 1808 for two and a half years lodging first in Rotherhith and then in Limehouse. Nautical projects. In 1808 Trevithick entered a partnership with Robert Dickinson businessman, a West India merchant. Dickinson supported several of Trevithick's patents. The first of these was the nautical laborer, a steam tug with a floating crane propelled by paddle wheels. However, it did not meet the fire regulations for the Dicks, and the Society of Coal Whippers, worried about losing their livelihood, even threatened the life of Trevithick. Another patent was for the installation of iron tanks in ships for storage of cargo and water instead of in wooden casks. A small works was set up at Limehouse to manufacture them, employing three men. The tanks were also used to raise sunken wrecks by placing them under the wreck and creating buoyancy by pumping them full of air. In 1810 a wreck near Margate was raised in this way but there was a dispute over payment and Trevithick was driven to cut the lashings loose and let it sink again. In 1809, Trevithick worked on various ideas on improvements for ships, iron floating docks, iron ships telescopic iron masts, improved ship structures, iron boys and using heat from the ship's boilers for cooking. Illness financial difficulties and return to Cornwall. In May 1810 Trevithick caught typhoid and nearly died. By September, he had recovered sufficiently to travel back to Cornwall by ship, and in February 1811 he and Dickinson were declared bankrupt. They were real not discharged until 1814. Trevithick having paid off most of the partnership debts from his own funds. Cornish boiler and engine. In about 1812 Trevithick designed the Cornish boiler. These were horizontal, cylindrical boilers with a single internal fire tube or flue passing horizontally through the middle. Hot exhaust gases from the fire passed through the flue thus increasing the surface area heating the water and improving efficiency. 
these types were installed in the Bolton and Watt pumping engines at Dolkoth and more than doubled the efficiency. Again in 1812, he installed a new high.